Captain John Marcus stared out of the viewport as his ship approached Atria, his home planet, now a shadow of its former vibrancy. The once blue planet was scarred with great swaths of black and gray, the aftermath of a Creelian attack that had left no city unturned, no community unscathed. As the ship descended through the atmosphere, the full extent of the devastation became heartbreakingly apparent. Buildings were reduced to rubble, forests were scorched earth, and the air was thick with the acrid smell of burning that even the ship's filters couldn't fully erase. Marcus had left Atria, a bustling hub of commerce and activity, teeming with life and promise. Now, it seemed a desolate wasteland, abandoned by the galaxy's protectors. The Galactic Council, who had dismissed the Creelian's aggressive maneuvers as a minor border conflict. His jaw tightened as the betrayal sank in. They had been left to fend for themselves and they had paid dearly. Captain, we are ready to land, Lieutenant Harvey reported, his voice steady despite the grim view from the cockpit. Proceed, Marcus replied, his voice barely above a whisper, tinged with the cold fury that had built up during the silent journey back home. The landing was smooth, a stark contrast to the chaos that had engulfed the planet when Marcus had last been here. He stepped out of the ship, his boots crunching on the mixture of ash and debris that carpeted the once pristine launch pad. He scanned the horizon, the silence oppressive, the desolation complete. Sir, over here, called Sergeant Peters, who was part of the reconnaissance team. Marcus walked over his gaze following Peters's outstretched arm to a small group of survivors huddled in the shadow of a crumbling wall. They were dirty, thin, and looked utterly defeated. How many? Marcus asked as he approached the group, his heart sinking with each step. Not many, sir, Peters replied, his voice heavy. We've scanned the area. These are the only ones we've found so far. Marcus nodded solemnly and turned to the survivors. I'm Captain John Marcus. We're here to help. Can you tell me what happened? He asked, crouching beside an elderly man who seemed to be the leader of the group. The man looked up, his eyes hollow yet burning with an unquenchable fire. They came without warning, he began, his voice raspy from disuse. The Creelians destroyed everything. The Council did nothing. They abandoned us. The words stung Marcus, confirming his worst fears about the Council's indifference. We won't abandon you, Marcus vowed, his tone resolute. We will make them pay for what they've done. The man nodded, managing a frail smile. We have little left to offer in thanks, Captain, but our gratitude is yours. Marcus stood, turning back to survey the ruin that stretched as far as the eye could see. He knew then what he had to do. He would gather the remnants of Atria's defenses, rally the survivors, and forge them into a force capable of exacting vengeance. The Galactic Council might have forsaken them, but Marcus would not. He would take the fight to the Creelians and, in doing so, expose the Council's failures. As he walked back to his ship to begin preparations, his resolve hardened. This was not just a mission of rescue anymore. It was one of retribution. Marcus would not rest until justice was served, until every lost life was avenged. After his return to Atria and the realization of the dire situation, Captain John Marcus knew that mere survival was not enough. Driven by a desire for justice and a need to protect what remained of humanity's frontier colonies, he began the monumental task of assembling what he called the Forgotten Fleet, a ragtag armada of decommissioned ships, repurposed to fight against the Creelians and to challenge the complacency of the Galactic Council. Marcus started by reaching out to his old contacts within the military, many of whom had been sidelined or retired early due to political purges or budget cuts. He sent secure communications to former comrades, appealing to their sense of duty and their discontent with the Council's actions. Listen, I'm putting together a fleet, Marcus explained in a secure call to Commander Alan Shaw, an old ally. We need every able ship and every willing hand. Are you with me? Shaw, who had spent the last few years in disillusioned retirement, responded with a weary but resolute tone. John, you know I've been waiting for a call like this. You can count on me. I'll rally the boys. We have a few old birds that can still fly. With Shaw's support secured, 
Marcus organized a series of covert meetings on various neutral stations and remote outposts. These meetings were tense, filled with the hushed tones of strategy and the clinking of glasses to newfound hope. Many of the attendees were veterans like Shaw, eager to find a purpose in what seemed a lost cause. Others were young idealists, drawn by Marcus's reputation and the righteous cause he championed. In one such meeting, Held in the shadowy corners of an abandoned supply depot, Marcus addressed a room full of potential recruits. His voice was firm, his message clear. This is not about revenge. It's about justice. It's about showing the Council and the universe that humanity will not stand down in the face of tyranny. As the recruits signed on, the challenge of retrofitting the aging ships became apparent. The fleet comprised everything from small fighters to large capital ships all of which needed significant upgrades to be battle-ready. Marcus coordinated with engineers and technicians who volunteered, turning derelict vessels into functioning warships with jury-rigged enhancements. One of the critical moments in this phase came when Dr. Lena Kim, a brilliant but underappreciated engineer, proposed using experimental technology to enhance the fleet's capabilities. During a workshop session on one of the larger ships, she demonstrated her prototype of an energy-efficient shield booster. If we integrate this into our ships, we can double our defense capabilities with minimal power consumption, Dr. Kim explained, showing the schematics on a holographic display. Marcus, impressed by her innovation, immediately approved its integration across the fleet. Do whatever it takes, Dr. Kim. Make it happen, he ordered. Day by day, the forgotten fleet grew, not just in numbers, but in spirit. The docks buzzed with activity as people worked tirelessly, fueled by a mix of fear, anger, and a burgeoning sense of camaraderie. Ships that had been mothballed for decades were brought back to life, engines roaring to the tune of impending conflict. As the fleet prepared for its first real test, Marcus stood looking over the dock from the command center of the flagship. He knew the road ahead was fraught with peril, but there was a palpable sense of determination that permeated the air. This fleet, forgotten by the government and discarded by the galaxy, was ready to make its mark, to fight back against the enemies of humanity, and to reclaim their place in the cosmos. The preparation phase was over, and Captain John Marcus understood that the forgotten fleet needed more than sheer willpower and old tech to confront the Creelians effectively. It was time to equalize the odds by acquiring advanced technology. Marcus planned a daring raid on a Galactic Council depot known for its state-of-the-art military hardware. The depot, located on a secure asteroid in the neutral zone, was rumored to house everything from energy shields to prototype weapons. Marcus gathered his top crew for the briefing, detailing the high-risk operation with precise, clear directives. We're not just out to take what we need. We're sending a message that we are still a force to be reckoned with, Marcus asserted, setting the tone of the mission in the command room of his flagship. The team consisted of seasoned pilots, skilled hackers, and combat veterans. Among them was Lieutenant Harvey, an expert in electronic warfare, who would be crucial for bypassing the depot's security systems. Harvey outlined his part of the plan, using technical schematics of the depot's defenses. Once we're in, it's about swift execution. I'll disable the alarms and cloak our digital signature. We get in, grab what we need, and get out before they can even launch a counter-response. The night before the operation, the atmosphere among the crew was tense, yet determined. Marcus walked through the hangar where the strike team was doing final checks on their gear and weapons. Stopping by each member, he offered words of encouragement, emphasizing the importance of their roles. The raid commenced under the cover of a meteor shower, providing natural cover for the fleet's approach. Marcus's ship, cloaked and silent, led the insertion team towards the asteroid. As they neared the depot, the tension was palpable. Harvey, focused and calm, began the sequence to bypass the outer security grid. Security grid down, moving to phase two, Harvey whispered over the comm. The team expertly navigated through the corridors of the depot, making their way to the main storage area. Here, they encountered robotic guards. Quick and coordinated, the team neutralized the threats with precision, using non-lethal tactics to maintain stealth. Reaching the armory, 
They were met with rows of high-tech weaponry and shield generators. Marcus directed the team to prioritize the most compact and powerful items. Grab the energy cores. Those will be crucial for upgrading our defenses, he instructed, keeping watch at the entry point. As they loaded their hall into portable containment units, an alarm finally blared. The depot had initiated an automated lockdown sequence. Time to go, Marcus barked, signaling the team to expedite their exit. Harvey worked furiously to stall the lockdown, giving the team just enough time to escape the tightening security. They raced back to their ship, under the increasing threat of capture. Just as they cleared the depot, enemy reinforcements arrived, launching a barrage of fire towards Marcus's ship. The pilot, maneuvering with impressive skill, dodged the incoming attacks, propelling them out of the asteroid's gravity well and into the safety of space. Once clear, Marcus let out a sigh of relief. The mission was a success, but more importantly, it was a significant morale booster for the entire fleet. Back on the flagship, the crew celebrated their narrow escape and the new capabilities that the stolen technology would provide. We did more than survive today. We thrived, Marcus stated to his crew, acknowledging each member's bravery and expertise. This raid not only equipped the forgotten fleet with necessary tools, but also reinforced their resolve to stand against the Creelians and any who dared underestimate the resilience of humanity. With the newly acquired technology integrated into their ships, the Forgotten Fleet, led by Captain John Marcus, began testing their enhanced capabilities in skirmishes against Creelian scout units. These initial confrontations were crucial, serving both as real-world tests of their new equipment and as strategic probes into the enemy's weaknesses. One such skirmish occurred near the debris field of Galaris, a once-thriving mining colony destroyed in the early days of the Creelian invasion. Marcus piloted his flagship, the Vindicator, at the forefront of the formation. His tactical display buzzed with incoming data as enemy ships appeared on the sensors. Enemy units incoming, Captain. Three, no, four Creelian scouts, announced Lieutenant Harvey, his voice calm yet alert. Power up the shields, and let's give our new weapons a field test. Target their engines. I want them disabled, not destroyed, Marcus commanded. His directive was clear. This was an information-gathering mission, not a seek-and-destroy operation. The Forgotten Fleet maneuvered into position, unleashing a volley of synchronized fire from their upgraded ion cannons. The Creelian ships, caught off guard by the intensity and precision of the attack, scrambled to retaliate but found their engines malfunctioning, their movements sluggish. As the Creelians struggled, a moral dilemma presented itself. The enemy ships were now sitting ducks, and the crew awaited Marcus's order. Would he take advantage of the situation to eliminate the Creelian threat here and now, or would he adhere to the rules of engagement he had set to minimize loss of life? Captain, we have them disabled. Should we finish them off? Asked Commander Shaw, uncertainty in his voice. Marcus paused his gaze fixed on the tactical screen showing the disabled Creelian ships. No, he finally said. Prepare to board and secure the ships. We need prisoners for intelligence, not casualties. Let's stick to the plan. The decision was met with mixed reactions. Some crew members felt a more aggressive approach was necessary to deter future incursions, while others appreciated Marcus's adherence to a higher ethical standard. This decision underscored the ongoing tension between achieving military objectives and maintaining a moral compass in war. Following the skirmish, Marcus convened a debriefing with his top officers. I know some of you may disagree with my decisions today, but we must remember who we are, Marcus addressed the room. We're not just fighting for survival. We're fighting to prove that humanity deserves a place at the galactic table. We won't do that by stooping to the enemy's level. Understood, Captain. But how far will we go before we consider changing tactics? Commander Shaw posed the question that was on many minds. We evaluate as we go, Marcus replied. Stay flexible, stay sharp, and keep our integrity intact. That's how we win this, not just by defeating the enemy, but by earning the respect of the galaxy. The crew continued their series of skirmishes, each encounter serving as a learning experience and a test of their resolve. Marcus frequently faced similar moral choices, 
balancing the harsh necessities of war with his unwavering commitment to lead with honor. These decisions did not just define the character of their fleet, but also set a precedent for how humanity would be viewed by the wider galaxy. As the Forgotten Fleet approached the Creelian homeworld, Captain John Marcus felt the weight of command heavier than ever. He had led his makeshift armada across the galaxy, engaging in skirmishes that tested their mettle and prepared them for this moment, their most daring and dangerous operation yet. The Creelian homeworld, known as Creel Prime, was heavily fortified with both orbital and surface-based defenses. Marcus knew that a frontal assault would be costly. In the briefing room aboard the Vindicator, he outlined the battle plan with clear, concise instructions. His crew listened intently, aware of the stakes at hand. We'll use the asteroid belt for cover as we approach the planet, Marcus explained, pointing to the hollow map displaying their route. Our main target is the planetary defense grid. Once we take that out, it will give us a short window to launch our ground forces. Lieutenant Harvey, responsible for navigation and tactics, voiced a concern. The Creelians will be expecting an attack, sir. They'll have their fleet ready. Marcus nodded, acknowledging the risk. That's why we'll need to be quick and precise. We can't afford a prolonged battle. Hit them hard and fast, then pull back. As the fleet maneuvered through the asteroid belt, the tension was palpable. Each ship's crew prepared for the imminent battle, checking their systems and weapons one last time. Marcus remained on the bridge of the Vindicator, coordinating the movements of the fleet with calm precision. The initial phase of the assault began with a barrage of long-range missiles aimed at disrupting the Creelian's sensor arrays. Explosions lit up the dark space as the missiles found their targets, creating a brief but effective disarray among the Creelian defenses. Now! All ships, advance! Marcus commanded, seizing the moment of confusion. The fleet surged forward, closing the distance to Creel Prime. As they broke through the outer defense lines, Creelian fighters swarmed to meet them. The battle was fierce, with both sides exchanging heavy fire. Marcus's ship led the charge, its upgraded shields holding firm against the onslaught. He issued commands rapidly, directing his ships to focus their fire on the defense grid's main generators. Squadron leaders, target the northern generator. On my mark, fire all cannons, he ordered through the comm. The coordinated strike was successful. The main generator suffered catastrophic damage, crippling the planetary shields. Cheers erupted on the bridge, but Marcus knew the battle was far from over. We have a narrow window before they reroute auxiliary power. Ground teams, you're clear to launch, he said, switching to the ground assault frequency. As the ground forces descended to the planet, Marcus kept a vigilant watch from above. The Creelian response was swift, attempting to regroup and counterattack. But the initial success of the Forgotten Fleet had given them a crucial advantage. Throughout the operation, Marcus remained acutely aware of the cost of each maneuver. He made decisions not just as a tactician, but as a leader responsible for the lives under his command. The assault on Creel Prime would likely determine the outcome of their campaign and he was determined to see it through with as few casualties as possible. Keep pressing forward, but stay alert. We're not done yet, Marcus cautioned his crew, prepared for the Creelian's next move. The assault on the Creelian homeworld marked a turning point in the Forgotten Fleet's campaign, a bold statement of humanity's resilience and strategic acumen. Captain John Marcus had led his fleet not just to a military victory, but to a moral one reaffirming their right to stand defiant in the face of overwhelming odds. In the aftermath of the successful strike on Creel Prime, while Captain John Marcus and his crew were consolidating their gains and preparing for the next phase of operations, an urgent communication from the Galactic Council interrupted their brief celebration. The message was clear and stark, a direct ultimatum from the highest political authority known to the civilized galaxy. Aboard the Vindicator, tension spiked as the communication officer handed Marcus the encrypted message. With a deep breath, Marcus opened the transmission, the contents projecting in stark holographic clarity above the main console of the bridge. The emblem of the Galactic Council rotated ominously as the message began to play. This is Ambassador Ilian, speaking on behalf of the Galactic Council, the hologram of a stern, middle-aged diplomat announced. His voice was firm, the tone not just of disappointment, but of thinly-veiled threat. Captain Marcus, 
While the Council recognizes the dire situation that prompted your actions, we cannot overlook the violation of several interstellar accords. Cease your hostilities immediately and withdraw your forces, or face severe consequences. The bridge crew fell silent, the weight of the ultimatum hanging heavy in the air. Marcus's expression remained unreadable as he processed the implications. The threat was not just of diplomatic isolation, but likely involved economic sanctions and military retaliation, which could cripple Earth's burgeoning efforts to assert itself. Lieutenant Harvey, who had been monitoring the transmission closely, spoke up. Captain, they're putting us in an impossible position. If we pull back now, everything we've achieved... I know, Lieutenant, Marcus interrupted, his gaze still fixed on the fading hologram. He considered their options, each scenario running through his mind with tactical precision. Retreating now would undermine their momentum and sacrifice the upper hand they had so perilously gained. Marcus turned to face his crew, his decision made. Prepare a response. Make sure it goes directly to Ambassador Ilion and the entire Council. His voice was calm but carried an underlying resolve that resonated through the command deck. Gathering his thoughts, Marcus recorded his reply. Ambassador, with all due respect, the Forgotten Fleet engaged the Krelians to protect human lives and interests, something the Council failed to do. We seek no war with the Council, but we will not abandon our position or our principles. We urge the Council to reconsider their stance for the sake of a united galactic community. Sending the message, Marcus knew the diplomatic repercussions would be significant. The Council might move to enforce their ultimatum, which could lead to an escalated conflict, one that might spread across multiple systems. Set Condition 2 throughout the fleet. Prepare for possible reprisals, Marcus ordered, turning back to the viewport, his eyes scanning the vastness of space that now seemed poised on the brink of greater conflict. The crew moved to comply, each member aware that their actions henceforth were not just about survival, but about defining the future role of humanity in the galaxy. The Forgotten Fleet had become a symbol of defiance and resilience, a beacon for those who felt marginalized by the larger political machinations of the Galactic Council. Marcus's handling of the ultimatum would go on to be a defining moment, not just for his fleet, but for all of humanity. The choices made in the coming days would either cement their place in the galactic community or relegate them to the shadows from which they had so fiercely emerged. After sending his response to the Galactic Council's ultimatum, Captain John Marcus prepared for the potential repercussions. His decision to continue the engagement had put the Forgotten Fleet at a significant risk of conflict, not only with the Krelians, but also potentially with forces dispatched by the Council. However, Marcus also initiated a parallel strategy that focused on negotiation and diplomacy, aiming to de-escalate the situation and secure a favorable outcome for Earth and its colonies. The strategic retreat began under Marcus's direct command. Pull back to the rally point, Echo. We need to regroup and reassess our position, Marcus instructed his fleet. The ships, still bristling from their recent encounter at Creel Prime, moved into a defensive formation, creating a perimeter around their most critical assets and injured ships. This maneuver was not a surrender, but a calculated withdrawal, designed to reduce their profile as a direct threat to the Creelian homeworld and to demonstrate to the Galactic Council that Marcus was willing to engage in dialogue. While the fleet repositioned, Marcus initiated back-channel communications with several non-Council member planets that had expressed sympathy for Earth's plight. His goal was to build a coalition, or at least secure tacit support, that could influence the Council's aggressive posture towards Earth. Make sure those communications are secure. We can't afford interception, Marcus emphasized to Lieutenant Harvey, who coordinated the encrypted transmissions. Parallel to these efforts, Marcus opened a direct line to Ambassador Ilion of the Galactic Council. In a secure communication room, he started the difficult task of diplomacy. Ambassador Ilion, I have ordered a strategic retreat. We are prepared to negotiate terms that will ensure the security of human colonies without further escalation, Marcus stated clearly, showing his willingness to cooperate, but also his readiness to protect human interests. The ambassador, initially rigid and formal, softened slightly in response to Marcus's conciliatory move. Captain Marcus, 
Your actions speak to a desire for peace. What assurances can you give that further aggressions will not occur? Ilion inquired, his tone now open to dialogue. We will agree to a ceasefire and open peace talks under neutral auspices. Furthermore, we are willing to share intelligence on the Creelians, which could benefit all council members, Marcus offered, showcasing his commitment to a galaxy-wide stability. These negotiations continued over several tense hours, with Marcus navigating the complex political landscape. Each decision, each concession was carefully weighed against the potential benefits for Earth's strategic position in the galaxy. During this time, Marcus also met privately with his senior staff in the war room of the Vindicator. We may have to make some hard compromises, but our primary goal is to secure the safety and sovereignty of our colonies, he explained to the group, preparing them for the potential outcomes of the negotiations. As the strategic retreat ensured the fleet's safety, the negotiations led to preliminary agreements. The Council, recognizing the legitimacy of Earth's grievances and the strategic value of the intelligence offered by Marcus, began to consider a more favorable stance towards Earth. The retreat and negotiation phase marked a critical point in Marcus's leadership, balancing military tactics with diplomacy. It highlighted his adeptness not only as a military commander, but also as a diplomat capable of navigating the intricate dance of interstellar politics. Following intense negotiations and a strategic retreat, Captain John Marcus managed to broker an agreement that significantly altered Earth's position within the Galactic Council. The resolution of these negotiations marked a pivotal moment in human history, enhancing Earth's standing and role within the interstellar community. As Marcus and his team worked tirelessly to finalize the terms of the agreement, the atmosphere aboard the Vindicator was one of cautious optimism. The crew gathered in the main assembly hall, waiting for Marcus to address them on the outcome. Marcus stepped onto the platform, his presence commanding attention. Today, we have taken a significant step forward, he began, his voice resonant in the quiet of the hall. Through our efforts, the Galactic Council has agreed to recognize the sovereignty of Earth and our right to defend our colonies. Furthermore, they have accepted our proposal to join several key committees that influence security and defense policies galaxy-wide. This announcement was met with a murmur of approval from the crew. Their sacrifices and the risks they had taken were now validated by this newfound recognition and respect on the galactic stage. We have also secured agreements for trade and mutual defense with other council members, Marcus continued, detailing the benefits of their new standing. This will bring prosperity to our planet and ensure that the security of our colonies is never again overlooked. The political resolution also included stipulations for sharing intelligence about the Creelians with the Council. This cooperation aimed to prevent future conflicts and foster a more unified approach to galactic threats. We will be sharing what we have learned about the Creelians with the Council, Marcus explained. In exchange, they have pledged to support our defenses and aid in the rebuilding of the colonies affected by the war. After the assembly, Marcus held a closed meeting with his senior officers and key diplomatic advisors to discuss the long-term implications of their new role. We need to be vigilant, he cautioned. Our increased influence comes with greater responsibility. We must be adept not only on the battlefield, but also in the chambers of the council. During these discussions, it was clear that Marcus's strategy was to ensure that Earth would play a significant part in shaping the future of the galaxy. This strategy involved careful planning and continued diplomacy to maintain their position and influence. Lieutenant Harvey, who had been pivotal in the communications during their campaign, asked, What are our next steps in terms of Council involvement? We begin by establishing our offices on the Council's space station. We'll need to appoint representatives who are not only politically savvy, but also understand our strategic and military ethos, Marcus replied, outlining the practical steps to integrate into their new roles. As Earth's new standing was communicated across human colonies and to other civilizations, it signaled a new era of human engagement in galactic affairs. Marcus, once a military leader, now also emerged as a key figure in interstellar diplomacy. The resolution of the political standoff and the subsequent rise in Earth's status were celebrated across human-controlled space. However, Marcus remained aware of the challenges ahead. 
We have secured a seat at the table, he noted to his advisors. Now we must ensure that we are strong and wise enough to keep it. This strategic victory demonstrated not only Marcus's tactical acumen, but also his ability to navigate complex political landscapes, marking a significant milestone in human history. Upon his return to Earth, Captain John Marcus was met not just with the ceremonial fanfare typical of a hero's welcome, but also with the palpable relief and renewed hope of the people he had fought to protect. The streets were lined with citizens waving flags, and the air was filled with the sounds of marching bands and cheering crowds. Yet despite the celebration, Marcus felt a profound sense of responsibility weigh upon him. He understood that his actions had reshaped Earth's position in the galaxy, and that the real work was just beginning. As he stepped off the transport ship onto the landing platform, a delegation of Earth's newly formed Interstellar Relations Board was there to greet him. Among them was General Carter, who had been a skeptic of Marcus's unconventional tactics, but now bore a look of respect and gratitude. Captain Marcus, your courage and leadership have opened new doors for Earth, General Carter stated as he shook Marcus's hand firmly. We are here not just to welcome you back, but to affirm our commitment to the new paths you have helped forge. Marcus nodded, acknowledging the General's words. Thank you, General. I hope our actions continue to strengthen Earth and bring security to our people, he replied, his tone reflecting the gravity of his mission. From the platform, Marcus was escorted to a large assembly hall where leaders from various Earth colonies had gathered. As he entered, the assembly rose in a standing ovation. Marcus, unaccustomed to such adulation, felt a mix of pride and discomfort. He was a soldier at heart, more at ease in the cockpit of his ship than in the political arena. At the podium, Marcus addressed the assembly. His speech was straightforward and devoid of the usual embellishments of political discourse. We have achieved much, but this is just the beginning, he declared. Our place in the Galactic Council is not just an honor, it is a responsibility. We must be vigilant, proactive, and united. After the assembly, Marcus had private meetings with various planetary representatives. Discussions focused on defense strategies, trade relations, and technological exchanges that would benefit Earth and its allies. Each meeting reinforced the importance of the alliances Marcus had fought to establish. Later, in a quieter moment away from the public eye, Marcus visited the memorial wall where the names of those who had fallen in the conflict were engraved. The solitude allowed him a moment to reflect on the cost of their victory. He traced the names with his finger, each one a reminder of the sacrifices that had paved the way for their newfound status. As he stood there, Lieutenant Harvey approached, his presence a comfort to Marcus. It's good to have you back, Captain, Harvey said, but I can see that the fight has followed you home. Marcus looked at his loyal lieutenant, a slight smile breaking through his somber demeanor. Perhaps it has, lieutenant. But we face it together, as we always have. This return to Earth marked a new chapter for Marcus, not as a war hero returning from battle, but as a leader who must navigate the complexities of political power and interstellar diplomacy. His actions had changed the course of human history, and now he must lead his people into this uncertain future, ensuring the sacrifices made were honored through wise governance and steadfast leadership. After securing Earth's new status on the Galactic Council and navigating the celebratory events upon his return, Captain John Marcus faced the monumental task of preparing for the future challenges that lay ahead. Back in his office on the Vindicator, the walls lined with star charts and digital screens flickering with reports, Marcus and his team gathered to strategize. The room was quiet, save for the soft hum of computers and the occasional shuffle of papers. Marcus sat at the head of the table, his eyes scanning the latest intelligence reports. The Creelians might be down, but they're not out. We also have the Council watching our every move now, Marcus noted, his voice steady and commanding. Lieutenant Harvey nodded in agreement his eyes fixed on a digital map displaying potential hotspots of conflict. We need to strengthen our alliances with other council members. It's not enough to have a seat at the table. We must ensure they see us as essential partners, Marcus continued. He was not just thinking about military might. 
but also about economic and technological collaborations that could solidify Earth's position. Harvey chimed in, I've started dialogue with the Tikarians. They have advanced propulsion technology that could benefit our fleet. Perhaps a joint research initiative could serve both our interests. That's a good start. Make it a priority, Harvey. We need all the leverage we can get, Marcus replied, marking the Tikarian system on the map. Next, Marcus addressed the ongoing need for military preparedness. Commander Shaw, I want a full review of our fleet's capabilities. We've added a lot of new tech. It's time to integrate it fully and ensure all crews are up to speed. Shaw, always meticulous, responded with a nod. I'll schedule drills and simulations. It's crucial we stay sharp. As the meeting progressed, they discussed the potential economic sanctions and political pressures that might arise from their newfound prominence. Marcus knew that Earth's aggressive stance in the conflict might lead to scrutiny or even jealousy from other council members. We must also prepare for non-military challenges. Diplomacy will be our first line of defense going forward, Marcus asserted, understanding the balance of power had shifted. He planned to attend the upcoming council meetings personally, aiming to foster a reputation for Earth as a peace-seeking but formidable member. After concluding the strategic session, Marcus took a moment to gaze out of his office viewport, looking out at the stars. Each point of light represented both a potential ally and a possible threat. His mind raced with the complexities of interstellar politics and the responsibility he carried not just to defend, but also to lead. Before leaving the room, Harvey approached Marcus. There's a lot on our plate, Captain. Are you sure we're ready for all this? Marcus turned, his expression one of resolve mixed with a hint of weariness. We have to be, Lieutenant. We have to be. The meeting encapsulated the broad scope of challenges awaiting Marcus and Earth. Not only were military readiness and alliance building crucial, but navigating the intricate dance of diplomacy with the Galactic Council was now an unavoidable aspect of his command. The days of straightforward combat missions were behind him, replaced by a future where every decision could affect the fate of Earth on the galactic stage. 